So one thing we can do is we, you know, it's a simplified model, is we can just fit a linear, just fit a linear line, the best fit that fits the data to that. And if we do that, then what we get is called the linearized Moore envelope, right? So again, the real failure envelope is the line that is tangent to all those circles. But as a model, as an engineer, we say, well, I want to use a, a little bit simpler model because it's unlikely I'm going to be able to go to the lab and do 100 tests and get a really good construction. I'm going to be able to go and do two or three tests, right? And from that, I'll fit the best, best fit straight line that I can. And this becomes the linearized Moore envelope. And this is our so-called Moore Coulomb failure criteria. And while we're going to discuss more complicated failure criterion in this class, even today, we're going we're to move on and discuss more complicated ones. Uh, in terms of solving problems, this failure criterion will be the only one we'll ever use. Okay? Because it's simple enough we can solve problems by hand or, or with you know, very simple computer pro programs. To, if you go on to more complex models, um, you really have to do that. You can only do that in the context of um, like finite element simulation, typically. Okay? So where this line, this straight line, this best fit straight line, where it crosses the, the y-intercept or the shear axis, we call that the cohesion, right? So this S0 is called cohesion. And it's called cohesion because, remember, the, the x-axis is the normal stress, right? Um, or actually, at the, you know, looking at one of these more circles, when sigma 3 is equal to 0, this would be when there's no confining pressure, right? That's an unconfined compressive test, OK? So if you have no no external pressure, no confinement on the sample, then this is a measure of the shear resistance of the material. Right? So if I have a sample and I shear it, um, and it, the word cohesion comes from, you know, originally a lot of these models were developed for soil mechanics, right? So y if you imagine you have a loose, unconsolidated sand, it doesn't really have any cohesion, right? It doesn't have any resistance or very, very low resistance to, to shear, right? If you just have a pile of dry sand in your hand and you run your hand across it, it's not going to resist the motion of that very much, right? However, if you have a clay, right, or saturated, you know, even beach sand, if you get it wet, I mean, that's how you make a sandcastle, right? So uh, if you have some saturation in the sand, then it will have some cohesion. In other words, now you take that same sort of wet sand and you hold it in your hand and you run it across, it's going to have some resistance to shear and that's called the cohesion. That's where the, the word comes from because it, it, you know, it has a cohesive forces. The water in this case causes some cohesive forces. And then of course, uh, as, you, uh, as you increase the confinement, then the material would always have more resistance to shear or more, you know, if, if you, um, you know, even that loose, loose sand, if you were to say, pack that sand um, and, and stick it in a, in a membrane, right, uh, that the membrane itself, say, wouldn't affect the, you know, it would be a very thin membrane, essentially just to hold the material together, but it wouldn't necessarily itself have any strength. Then even just the fact that you're packing that material together in some way, now you would have some resistance to shear, and, and so that's cohesion. So um, the other observation then, of course, when sigma 3 is equal to 0, this is, uh, this is an unconfined compressive test. And so that, that value right there is your unconfined compressive strength, which you guys have done that test in the lab. Right? Now you should be able to just tell that if I have a, if I have a linearized Moore envelope or a Moore Coulomb failure criterion, which is essentially the, the equation of this line, that's the y, <coughs> that's the y-intercept, 
and the slope of the line is called the coefficient of friction, or, or the, the coefficient of internal friction. Right? So it's the slope of the line. And we use the symbol mu i, internal friction, for that. So that's a, that forms the equation of a line. Right? Then just through geometry, there's some relationship between C0 and S0. So S0 is not, so even though it, it's very obvious when you look at the plot what it is, it's not something we measure. Right? We don't go to the lab, typically, and measure cohesion directly. But you can measure unconfined compressive strength. And if you do enough tests that you have this this line, then you you know the, the the slope of the line is just you know it's the best fit to the real more envelope, right? So you, you you fit a straight line to it. Now you have the slope of that line is your internal friction angle. Then you can then relate the cohesion and the unconfined compressive strength, right? So often in the lab. You know, you measure the unconfined compressive strength. You don't measure the cohesion. You measure the unconfined compressive strength, and then you back calculate or infer what the cohesion would be from it. And that's how you use it. So there, you know, it's, that's just the equation of the line, right? The cohesion is the y-intercept. The Normal stress is the x-axis, and mu is the coefficient of friction, internal friction. And like I said, um, this is the relationship between the unconfined compressive strength and the cohesion. Right? So you can solve this equation for S0 to determine what the cohesion is from the unconfined compressive strength. And this equation just comes from geometry. You just work out the geometry um, from those circles. Another way to look at this is to plot it sigma 1 versus sigma 3. So uh, sigma 1 is a function of sigma 3. And if you do that and fit a line, now this line, I mean, it's different axis, right? Remember, the, the real Mohr-Coulomb failure criterion has sh uh, shear stress, normal stress, right? In this case, it's, it's S1, S3 first and third principal stresses. But the equation of this line, again, you can fit a line to it. So basically, the way you do this, you go in and you vary sigma 1 and sigma 3, and when the material fails, you put a dot. Right? And you do another test varying sigma 1 and sigma 3, and you put a dot. And you do another one. And then you fit a straight line to it. And the slope of this line can be related to the internal friction angle through this equation. And again, it just comes from geometry. So this is probably the more common way to look at it. So then you, you know what the internal friction angle is. You know what the unconfined compressive strength is because you've done that test. That's the most common test you would do. And then with those two things, you can construct the failure criteria. So this is real data on a sandstone. And you know the, the straight line model is just a model, right? The real failure envelope is not a straight line. It's, it's a curved line, right? Um, but if you plot it like this, then you know your your sort of r squared value of this line, or you know how how good your measure of goodness of this fit, can tell you if this is a good model or not. So in this case, that line fits the data pretty well. So you know you can say this is a, a pretty good model. And of course, where this where this uh, line inter intersects the axis is your you know this number here is your unconfined compressive strength. Right. So this is, uh, you know, some real data for sandstone. Uh, you know, over several tests, there's some more circles. The, the curved line is the real failure envelope. And then the linearized line is there. And you can see that, you know, the linearized line is really only a good fit for you know small small confining pressures, or you know for for, for small stress differences. Right? Right. So re again, remember the stress difference, the sigma one versus sigma three, is a measure of the shear strength of the material because the shear strength of the material is the radius of this circle. Right? So as um, 
So for you know when I say for when I say things like uh, small stress differences, that's analogous to saying small shear strength, or low, low shear strength. So in this case, the the linearized line is only a good fit for low shear strength, but as you low shear stresses, but as you go to higher values of shear stress. Then these two lines diverge quite a bit. Yeah. Mm, uh, I don't think you can make that statement. I think that that's just for this material. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, but also the the uh, I mean, another way to say it would be for small diameter circles. But for, you know, but by saying small diameter circles what I'm it's implying low values of shear stress. Because this distance here is is a measure of the shear stress. Anyway, uh, yeah. So for this for this sandstone, you can see it's a good fit. Um, you know, for part of the for part of the values, but then it, it diverges, right? So it, it just shows you that it's just a model, right? It's not it's not the model. It's not the best model. Um, as an aside, we're gonna we're gonna start to, we're gonna look at more more and more models. Does does anyone know how to choose the appropriate model? Because basically what we're going to do is we look at more and more models, we're going to add complexity, right? We're going to we're going to give up our simple linear model in favor of something that fits the data a little better. And then we're going to add additional physics, right? For example, in this model there's no sigma 2 doesn't apparently matter, right? So sigma 2 is in the middle of sigma 1 and sigma 3. But apparently, it doesn't matter for this model. The only thing that matters is sigma 1 and sigma 3. Well, how could that be? So we're going to look at models that take into effect sigma 2. And as we add more and more complexity, you know, there's basically more tests you need to do to fit these models and other things. So in the face, in the face of all of these choices of models, how do you know which is the right one to Choose. Well, there are some very quantitative ways to do th this. There's a whole field of mathematics called essentially uncertainty quantification that deals with this question. But even more qualitatively, yeah, is anyone familiar with the concept of Occam's razor? So Occam's razor is a concept which basically says that amongst competing models, the correct one to choose is the simplest one which agrees with the data, with the least assumptions. Yeah. And the reason for that is it's the easiest one, you know, the, the fewer assumptions, the fewer um, parameters in the model then the model's easier to falsify, right? So the way you do science is you, you hypothesize, and then you test that hypothesis, right? And you, you know, you never actually prove, I mean, you almost, you never prove that something is true. You just try to falsify it as many ways as you can, and you say, well, um, you know, in the face of what I've seen, I cannot falsify this model. It, it appears for all of these cases to fit the data well. And so in the spirit of Occam's razor, you should always choose the simplest one, which agrees with the data well, in a, you know, with, depending on your quantities of interest, right? Uh, you know, it, it, been, it also depends on, you know, you can have models that are very good for some quantities of interest, but not very good for others, depending on exactly what you're interested in. Um, 
Yeah, so you know, if you chose if you chose the, the linearized more Coulomb model and you were actually testing this material and you and you were starting to test for very large principal stress differences and it wasn't fitting the data very well, um, you'd have to say that, well, this is not a good model. I falsified this model and I need to use something more complex. I'll talk, there's a little bit, there's other considerations as an engineer where you're doing, when you're doing computations uh, that I'll, I'll discuss in a, in a moment. So uh, this is some real data for a wide variety of rocks. Um, you can see some of these have very, very low cohesive strengths, right? So, you know, basically all under low confining pressures, almost no resistance to shearing, right? Um, but you know, so the, the plot on the left is cohesive strength. The plot on the right is uh, coefficient of internal friction. And you see that even though many of the materials have um, very low cohesive strength, they all have some internal friction. And this implies that you know the, the internal friction is the slope of that line, right? So this implies that as I increase the pressure, as I go out on the normal axis, the materials are going to have an increased resistance to shear strain. Right? So if the, if the internal friction was zero, right, then that would say that it, it's pressure independent, right? If I, no matter how much I increase the normal stress, I don't change its its resistance to shear. Right? So you know, I don't know exactly what lithic tough is. Lithic tough is probably some kind of a some kind of consolidated, usually when you see tough, it's like some kind of a consolidated sand, right? Like a cementish sand. But evidently it's very low cementous because, cemented because uh, it has very low, under, under no confinement, it has very low cohesion, right? It doesn't resist shear very much. However, if you, you know, if you were to, for every, since this is almost one, let's just call it one, for every sort of one PSI of confinement you applied to it, then you would get a, a one PSI increase in shear strength of the material. Right? Um, I meant to change the label of this guy. The, the, the title of this plot does not match what the point of it is, so forget that. Uh, the t what we're going to look at this, this is a sort of a prelude of things to come. Um, but we're, what we're going to look at is how you can use these more circles for interpretation of wellbore strength and failure in, in drilling, right? So these lines, right, so now we're back on the shear stress versus normal stress. These lines are basically indication, they're models for the material properties, right? So they're, for a given material, they're, that it's a fixed line, right? In this case, it's just suggestive to say this is a weak rock and this is a strong rock, right? So it's just, so, you know, it's a model for the strength of the material, right? So we can't really control that. We're drilling in something and it has some strength, right? And that's the model. But what we can control in drilling, uh, is we can control through controlling the mud weight, we can control the size of the Mohr circle, right? So this is this is effective stress, so it includes the pore pressure. Right? And again, this is sort of a prelude of things to come, but what we'll see soon is that you know if you have a, a well bore, the the component of stress sigma RR, which is the, the normal you know, when we when we deal in well bore with well bores, since well bores are nominally circular, we're gonna we're gonna do everything in polar coordinates, right? And so uh, the sigma RR component is is as I have it drawn there, uh, the radial component from the center of the well bore. And what we'll see is that sigma RR is equal to sigma three, the the lowest principal stress. And that's equal to delta P, where delta P is equal to the difference in the mud weight and the pore pressure. So if you're if you're drilling balanced, 
if you're drilling balanced, meaning equal pore pressure and mud weight, I mean, all, all you guys have had drilling, right? So, so if you're drilling balanced and you have an equal pore pressure and mud weight, that means that sigma 3 is 0 and you're sitting right here. Right? And if you're drilling into a strong rock, you're, you're safe, right? no problem. If you're drilling into a weak rock, everything that, you know, all of this region of the circle is going to be failed material. And in fact, remember, you really can never be above this line. So what would happen in reality is, um, you know, far, you know, you'd never, the circle would never be that big, right? So sigma one is sort of indicative of, of the uh, in situ stresses, as we'll see, right? So these are due to the far field stresses. Sigma three we can control by changing the mud weight, right? And if we're drilling balanced then we'd be failing the material and you'd have breakouts. Now, just because you have breakouts doesn't mean you have an unstable wellbore, um, but it could mean you have an unstable wellbore. Most, most, uh, most wells do have some breakouts. But if you, were in a, uh, if you were in a situation where you were starting to lose the control of the wellbore uh, due to excessive breakouts or washing, you know, the whole wellbore is washing out, meaning you know, it's, it's basically continuous breakouts all along the diameter of the wellbore, and it's all of that material is falling down onto the bottom hole assembly. In that scenario, if you, if you could do it, you could increase the mud weight, which would drive, if you increase the mud weight, it would drive this circle this way, right? It would drive sigma 3 that way, so effectively shrinking the circle and getting you into a situation where you're no longer failing the material. But of course, now you're drilling, I mean, it's, it's not always that you can do that, right? Because now you're drilling over balance, which uh, slows you down, right? Because if you're drilling over balance, you're putting more pressure on the bottom hole assembly so that it makes it more difficult to move the cuttings to the, to the top, right? So uh, this is just a, a picture of how you can sort of visually use these more circles. For an application, we'll we'll talk a lot more about wellbore stability. Uh, I guess right after spring break. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so. Uh, this is a difficult, um, a little bit difficult to visualize, but what this is a, po a plot of the yield surface in what we call stress space. So this is a sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. Those are the principal the principal um, directions. And let's see if I can draw it. So like sigma one. I'm sorry, that's sigma. Sigma one, sigma two, something like that. But the, the thing that you're looking at here is that the, this, I don't know what to call that exactly. It's sort of a con conic shape or a, a pyramidal pyram shape but it's got six sides. We'll look at the end of it in a second. But the, it surrounds the line sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. So the line that goes right down the center is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. This is, this is called the hydrostat. And what this indicates is that, I mean, so this is a measure of pressure, essentially. And what this indicates is that as I travel down the hydrostat, and the way this is drawn is like compression is a negative number. Okay. The, the common uh, sign convention in, in mechanics in general is that tension is positive and compression is negative. Uh, often in geomechanics or petroleum engineering literature, 
it'll be the reverse. Uh, compression is positive, um, tension is negative, and if, and if that's the case, this, this same cone would be, it looked the same, it'd just be flipped over. In other words, it would, um, again, it's, it's sort of hexagonal. If you had a compression positive sign convention, it would sort of look like that. So, but what this means in this case, as, as drawn here, is that as I increase the pressure, right, pressure is equal hydrostatic compression, right, that I get an increase in shear strength. So basically the, diff, the, the distance from the hydrostat to the wall, the surface of this thing, is a, is a measure of the shear strength. So as I increase the pressure this way, this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which means the, the material can resist shear more. And this is how rocks behave. They're pressure dependent. Right? Likewise, the reason it gets small in the other direction is because rocks typically don't have much tension. Right? So if I, if I go this way right, into the tensile re regime, then you know, either right at the point zero, you know, when as soon as I have any tension, the rock's going to fail. But typically, you know, the rock does have a small amount of tensile strength. So, you know, typically the, the coordinate axis would be somewhere like right here. The zero, zero, zero point would be somewhere very near the top of that cone. Okay. But this cone, uh, as it's drawn, it, it, it's open to infinity. Right? So what that means is that as I increase the pressure, now think of pressure as hydrostatic confinement. So think of your, your experiment in the lab where you have a, the material confined on the sides, the pressure bath. As I increase that, I'll continually, forever, make the rock stronger and stronger and stronger. Do you think any material behaves like that? Like if I just squeeze it forever, to infinity. If I squeeze it, you know, to infinity, and then I, uh, it's just going to keep, keep getting stronger. It's never going to fail. But that's not really true, right? Real materials, real rocks have pores in them, and if you squeeze them hard enough, you'll you'll permanently squeeze the pores out of that material, right? So, uh, so this model can't be accurate for forever, for, you know, for infinite pressures, right? And so uh, a n the next step of complexity is to add a cap to the end of this, to the end of this graph, right? So that at some point, when I squeeze it to a certain point, I hit that cap, and now I'm permanently deforming the material in, pr in a pressure regime, right? Um, again, this is a failure surface, so the state of stress Right? I can take any stress tensor, I can evaluate sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and I can plot its location in this, in this plot. And if I'm inside this cone thing, I'm elastic. If it's outside, that's an invalid state of stress. can't really happen. So I'm either inside, in which I'm elastic, or I'm on the surface, in which case it's inelastic or plastic or failed. Failed material. Right? Um, as you go on to more complex be behavior, uh, these guys, the slope can change right? as a function of deformation. So uh, you know, the, the simple more Coulomb model, this, they're just fixed. Right? The, the, the slope of this is related to the angle of internal friction. But that itself can be a function of deformation. The, mo the, the cone can uh, translate in space as a function of deformation. Uh, that would give it some anisotropy. That's called anisotropic, uh, anisot uh, deformation-induced anisotropy. So, so all of these things add complexity to the models. And sometimes, to get really good fits to the data, you need them. So there, this is called the pi plane. So this is, now we're looking down that axis sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. Right? So we're looking straight down the hydrostat. 
and this is what you see, right? That sort of hexagonal shape. It's it's the same picture viewed from the end. Right? Uh, let's see. Right? It's as if you know I'm looking at the end of it. 